Good evening. I'm Elizabeth Alexander, president of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And I want to thank all of you for coming to be with us for this conversation uh, that you, you should know there are literally thousands of you out there. Uh, so we really appreciate your being here for a discussion about the power and potential of libraries and archives to deepen our understanding of history and call it to account. Tonight, we're going to explore how this memory work and practice can confront race, policing, mass incarceration, and our sense of who we are uh, as a nation and as communities. We're gonna talk about fostering equity of access and participation, about educating and training the next generation of librarians, archivists, and activists, because we think this work is so important. And I am so very happy that uh, we're being joined tonight by three extraordinary thinkers, scholars, and advocates, all of those together and more uh, for this conversation. Dr. Carla Hayden, Librarian of Congress. I'm going to introduce everyone fully in a moment. Dr. Kelly Lytle Hernandez, Professor at UCLA and Director and Principal Investigator for Million Dollar Hoods. And Jarrett Drake, Liberatory Memory Worker and PhD student in the Department of Anthropology at Harvard University. We at the Mellon Foundation, through our own work in higher ed education, in conservation and preservation, and in the fields of libraries and archives have long been concerned with fundamental questions about our shared historical record. Whose stories get remembered? Who tells those stories? How are those stories contextualized and shared? What implications arise from how we tell these stories and for whom? These are just some of the questions uh, that, that we are exploring in our work at Mellon through initiatives like our Monuments Projects, our an education initiative, liberation and learning, uh, our higher education and arts and culture work. Uh, and so these questions are equally pressing in the space of historical documentation and the archive. This has guided Mellon in its support of projects such as, I'm gonna show you just a, a, a little bit of what we've done. And there you saw all my notes flying all over the screen. Uh, this is the great Gwendolyn Brooks, uh, my, uh, my guide, my muse as a poet, uh, and we uh, show this picture uh, to talk about our purchase, co-purchase of the historic Ebony Jet Archive, which we undertook together with the Ford Foundation, the J. Paul Getty Trust, the John D. and Catherine MacArthur Foundation, and the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. This archival purchase ensured what is widely believed to be the most significant 20th century photographic archive of black life will be digitized and publicly accessible in perpetuity. Uh, I myself had never seen this picture of, uh, of my beloved Miss Brooks before. Uh, and this is, uh, she's holding uh, her novel. She wrote one novel, Maud Martha, in, and this is taken by Jet staff photographer, David Jackson. Similarly, Mellon has contributed to the acquisition of Harry Belafonte's personal archive by the Schomburgs. Oh, there he is. All right now. Um, as was, my parents had that record, Calypso, when we were uh, when growing up. And as a result, the encyclopedic record of the great Mr. Belafonte's career and life as an artist activist par excellence was brought back to Harlem where Belafonte was born. The materials span more than 70 years of his career and include, of course, his 1956 album Calypso, which we see here in the center, uh, which is the first album, by the way, by a solo artist to sell a million copies and is particularly interesting uh, when you think about um, uh, Belafonte's own uh, roots in Jamaica, listening to um, work songs uh, and field songs when he was growing up and uh, transforming that into a, a, a mass a, a art form. His archive joins those of James Baldwin, Malcolm X, uh, Fab Five Freddie Brathwaite at the Schomburg, uh, which is recognized in its expertise in the preservation and digitization 
which I'll be saying five times fast tonight, of documents relating to Black life and in making these materials as widely available as possible. And what I want to say about the Schomburg, also true, of course, about the Library of Congress, which as Dr. Hayden knows, I refer to, we refer to as the People's Library. Um, these extraordinary archives are available to researchers and scholars and PhD you know, students and professors, yes, but also to anybody who wants to go and read deeply and learn. These are public archives. Uh, Mellon is also committed to supporting community-based archives, which play such an important role in combating what professor and archivist Michelle Caswell calls the symbolic annihilation of marginalized communities from mainstream memory institutions, and which are therefore essential to the creation of more inclusive and polyvocal historical narratives. And one example uh, of these community-based archives is the Manila Town Heritage Foundation in San Francisco. This is an organization that promotes social and economic justice for Filipinos in the United States by preserving, advancing, and advocating for their arts and culture. And its current efforts include the acquisition, preservation, and digitization of at-risk works by five community-based media artists. And one of them is Antonio Remington, whose photograph we see here, that beautiful photograph, as well as the development of a publicly accessible di digital archive. Other examples of work that Mellon uh, supports in the archival space include nonprofit uh, and here community archives, nonprofit organizations like the Invisible Histories Project in Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, this uh, it preserves and collects the history of LGBTQ life in the South while also publicly elevating this history through exhibits, community programming, and engagement, teaching, and researching. And this picture is from the 1987 March on Washington for Lesbian and Gay Rights. Uh, and that is but one uh, historically important event that is documented uh, by the organization. Keep your church out of my crotch. I love that picture. Um, and at the same time, uh, through partnership with University of Alabama, Invisible Histories aims to expand the network of LGBTQ community-based archives at the universities of Alabama, Mississippi, and West Georgia with Mellon's support. These memory institutions are places that people seek out to learn about themselves, their cultural identity, history, and it is critical, uh, clearly, that libraries and archives uh, reflect uh, the diversity of who we are are. Uh, entire lives, entire communities, uh, entire histories can be lost if, if we do not attend to what I think we all believe is the sacred and urgent mission of increasing equity in archival work. So uh, you might say that the overarching uh, question of tonight is how can libraries and archives and the knowledge that is within serve as tools for justice? And so I will introduce with that more fully our panelists. Dr. Carla Hayden serves as our country's 14th Librarian of Congress, nominated to this position by President Barack Obama in 2016. She is the first woman and first African-American to lead our national library, the People's Library. And prior to this role, she was CEO of the Enoch Pratt Free Library in Baltimore, Maryland. Her distinguished professional record includes positions at the University of Pittsburgh, Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, and the Chicago Public Library, where she began her career as a library associate and children's librarian. And such incredibly important work. She also pre was president of the American Library Association from 2003 to 2004, and in 1995 was the first African-American to receive Library Journal's Librarian of the Year Award in recognition of her outreach services at the Pratt Library. She received a BA from Roosevelt University and an MA and PhD from the Graduate Library School of the University of Chicago. Dr. Hayden, we are so happy to have you here tonight. Thank you so Thank much. You. Um, we also have with us, um, Professor Kelly Lytle Hernandez, one of the nation's leading experts on race, immigration, and mass incarceration. She is a MacArthur Genius Award winner, is professor of history, African-American studies, and urban planning at UCLA, 
where she holds the Thomas E. Lifka Endowed Chair in History, as well as uh, is director of the Ralph J. Bunch Center for African American Studies at the university. She is the author of the amazing books that are, are so uh, of such widespread um, use and importance. Migra, A History of the U.S. Border Patrol, and that's 2010. City of Inmates, Conquest, Rebellion, and the Rise of Human Caging in Los Angeles, the latter of which won the 2018 James Rawley Prize from the Organization of American Historians, among several other honors. Uh, and uh, with, uh, with my, my older son, uh, uh, you are one of his uh, great uh, heroes uh, because of that book, which influenced him tremendously. So thank you for that. Um, uh, and she's also the director and principal investigator, and we'll talk about this some more, for Million Dollar Hoods, which is a university-based, community-driven research project that maps the fiscal and human cost of mass incarceration in Los Angeles, and which the Mellon Foundation is very proud to support. Kelly Lytle Hernandez, we are delighted to have you here this evening. Oh, thank, thank you, you for having me for this conversation. And our third guest is Jarrett Martin Drake. Mr. Drake is a PhD student in social anthropology at Harvard University, where he engages in a variety of archival, educational, and organizing projects that pertain to prison abolition. In addition to his doctoral work, he facilitates workshops with grassroots organizations around topics such as liberatory memory work, uh, which I love and want to hear more about, and digital archives asking questions as well about family and belonging through the archive. Prior to his time at Harvard, Mr. Drake was the digital archivist at Princeton University, during which he volunteered as an instructor in the New Jersey Scholarship and Transformative Education in Prisons Consortium through the Princeton Prison Teaching Initiative. He has also served as an advisory archi archivist for a People's Archive of Police Violence in Cleveland and worked at the Legacy of Slavery in Maryland initiative at the Maryland State Archives. Mr. Drake earned an MS in Information Science from the University of Michigan School of Information, where he worked at the Bentley Historical Library and the Special Collections Library, and a BA in History from Yale University. He was born and raised in Gary, Indiana, where he graduated from the Benjamin Banneker Achievement Center. Jarrett Drake, it is a great pleasure to see you here tonight and to see you again after so long. Happy to be here, thanks so much. So we're going to start our conversation uh, with what I hope was um, a fun uh, assignment for our guests. Um, we asked uh, everyone the question, uh, what was a, you know, because this stems from understanding uh, that archives are treasure troves. They are extraordinary places. Uh, they are, are places where we dig and dig and dig and uh, go for days and weeks and months sometimes uh, and then find something that suddenly um, shifts our understanding and can feel sort of miraculous. So we asked everyone to answer the question, what was an archival discovery that deeply affected you and the trajectory of your work? And we're going to start with uh, Dr. Hayden, uh, your discovery, if you would tell us about it, uh, which pertains to the great Frederick Douglass. Well, I have to say that it happened actually in the building that I'm in, the Madison Building of the Library of Congress. And I was uh, newly appointed. And as a career librarian, I thought I knew just about everything about the Library of Congress. But I went with one of the curators into, it looked like miles of shelving. And it passed uh, Thurgood Marshall and uh, all types of people. And then I got to Frederick Douglass. And I said, are, these are the papers of Frederick Douglass? Because he had been one of my heroes with his story in his autobiography about the importance of literacy. Once you learn to read, you'll be forever free. And knowing that literacy was so important. And so the curator said, yes. And I said, can I just look at it? Because I was getting chills. I was still living, in, uh, still living in Baltimore, where he spent time, Maryland, all of that. 
I'm from Illinois and spent summers in, in Springfield, Illinois, so grew up with the Lincoln and that. So I pulled out just a random box and I asked, could I look at one of the files? And I said, yes. And I pulled it out and there, and I opened it, and there in his own hand was his thoughts on the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. And in his hand, through the paper, you could feel the anger, the crossing out when it said assassinated. And then he crossed it out and said murdered, killed. Uh. And you, just seeing that and seeing that paper, that, that coming through the, all you could, just the emotion coming out. And it was just random because I grew up with the Lincoln lore and, and all of that and Frederick Douglass. A month or so later, I asked to, I wanted to make sure I was using that for uh, something uh, that I was going to talk about and asked for, and I had written down, good librarian that I am, uh, the, the file number and the, all of this, right, good archivist, write it down. I said, here it is, you can find it, I need to see it. The librarian came up a few hours later with a sheepish look on her face, and she said, um, you know, that file was misfiled. The person who had last used that box had not put it, it was from box 33, not 31. And the fact that that serendipity, that wow said to me, you need to create more experiences so people can discover, so people can have those moments and that led to what, and I hope we get a chance to talk about it, what the Mellon Foundation has just awarded the Library of Congress, an opportunity to give people more of those pinch me moments. That's when you have to unlock these archives. You have to make sure that more people can get into them, not just researchers and scholars, but everyone. Mm. That is amazing. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, when 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 young people uh, who, in the instance of a Frederick Douglass, for example, I mean, I think the way most of us understand Frederick Douglass is uh, as a, a, you know a, a slave, an emancipated slave who you know through the word moves the abolitionist movement forward. But then seeing him as a man of politics, a man of the world, uh, uh, you know, a, a peer to so many, um, uh, a person of that kind of feeling uh, about the political world around him is extraordinary. Yeah. Wow, He's thank you for that story. contemporary of Susan B. Anthony, yeah. Mm. Uh, and um, Dr. Lytle Hernandez, what is, um, what, is, what is your magic trinket that you brought us today? Sure. Well, first, Dr. Hayden, thank you for that story. I always want to hear more about Frederick Douglass and to hear about the power of his, his soul and his mind and his heart um, speaking to you is just very inspiring. So what I wanted to talk about is some of the work that I've been doing out here as a historian and trying to collect up and preserve the record of the age of mass incarceration. But I think I need to take a, a short step back to, to walk a journey with you all about my relationship with archives. Now, when I was mm -hmm. back in graduate school um, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, I was taught that you show up at a library, you show up at an archive, and you work with what is there. And there's an incredible amount of, of records that are available. However, the stories that I was interested in looking at, race and policing and mass incarceration, hadn't been archived, at least not from the perspective of most impacted people, right? Of undocumented folks, of black folks, of imprisoned folks, overly policed folks. And so what I have experienced as a historian working in this field is the necessity to go out and find and build archives, right? So working mm -hmm. with the American Friends Services to collect and preserve their records when they're fighting violence on the border working with colleagues in Mexico City to find and preserve the records of the Mexican Border Patrol. And in fact, those were held in a warehouse in sort of the belly of Mexico City under armed guard 
we had to negotiate with Mexican military to get access to those records and to bring them out into the light of day and get them into the archive. For tonight, what I really want to talk about is the records of the Los Angeles Police Department. Now, we all know that police records are infamously difficult to get at between the sort of the shadows of sunshine laws, police union contracts, and the wide berth of discretion that is given to public records officers, it can be extraordinarily difficult to get access to police records. But about um, five years ago, I was assisted by the ACLU of Southern California in a lawsuit against the LAPD in which we were able to force them to open up their records, um, provide access to new data of the contemporary moment, but we also won access to almost 200 boxes of historical records that had never been seen before and that were on track for destruction. So by pulling those records out and beginning to work with them, um, I found a gem, right? And so I wanna talk about that gem right now. That gem is a use of force file from 1976 in which the LAPD had a helicopter that was flying over Watts and identified a car that didn't have its headlights on. And that was enough, according to their own investigation of the incident that's about to occur, to engage with the driver of that car, to chase them down on foot and by air. And when an altercation ensued, to shoot Alonzo Simmons in the stomach. Alonzo Simmons suffered from extraordinary pain, multiple surgeries um, out of this incident. However, what the way that the LAPD publicly told this story was that Alonzo was not just a man who was driving in his station wagon with his lights off or sitting with his lights off, but in fact that he was a suspect for grand theft auto and spun the story as though he somehow deserved this violence, deserved the mm -hmm. shooting. Mm -hmm. So this is the kind of work that we're doing with this, this archive is we're going back, we're recovering the record of what happened, who did what to whom, at what consequence. And we call it reparative work to restore the story for those of us who've been most impacted so we can better understand everything that happened to us and take control of the narrative of um, police violence in particular. So that's my gem for tonight. That's extraordinary. And I think that, um, you know, what's also so powerful about what you're talking about is that records that were not designed to lead to our liberation or protection, right? You know, what does it mean for the historian and for the researchers to be able to add up what's found in those records once you've demanded access to them, you know, use the power of the law to construct, as you say, and that, you know, the, the, there's a, a transformation that takes place. Uh, you know, it, I think also about, um, for example, uh, in the arts and culture space or in the political space, uh, as, a, as someone who studies uh, Black people, um, uh, all of the things you can find in the Freedom of Information Act request that you might make to see someone's FBI file. Uh, and that there's incre you know, treasures there uh, that when the right scholar, researcher has it, uh, can be made to understand things very differently from the original purpose of surveilling uh, people uh, you know, unjustly. Uh, so you know, it's that, that the repair work uh, that you're talking about has so many applications and, and it's just amazing. Thank you. Um, Jarrett Drake, you have brought us something that takes us uh, from the historical uh, to the present. Uh, so could you talk about uh, about what 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 you what you've brought? Yes, so I think that the story that I'll tell connects beautifully with what Dr. Hayden and Dr. Hernandez have both shared with us today. So as Professor Alexander uh, mentioned during my introduction, um, I worked at the Maryland State Archives 10 years ago on a project called The Legacy of Slavery in Maryland. And that is a project that was started by the nephew of Alex Haley, Christopher Haley. And it was a mm. project that really focused on uplifting narratives of people who 
escaped from slavery, who fled slavery, as well as the people who assisted them. So uh, the counties in particular in Maryland that we were focused on were the counties of the Eastern Shore. Um, so Dr. Hayden mentioned Frederick Douglass, who of course is from the Eastern Shore. We know Harriet Tubman is from the Eastern Shore. We know that Frederick Douglass' wife is from the Eastern Shore of Maryland. So the Eastern Shore of Maryland had a long lineage and history of abolitionist activity. And so the archive that I wanted to talk about today involves a man by the name of John Brown, right? So when most people hear the name of John Brown and abolition, they think of the captain, John Brown, the raid that he led on Harper's Ferry, uh, for which he was, he was tried and executed. Uh, but I wanna talk about a different John Brown, a John Brown uh, based in Maryland in the 1850s. And John Brown helped three enslaved people, a small family in Kent County, Maryland, escaped from slavery. He was a, John Brown himself was a free black man. He worked as a farmer in Anne Arundel County, um, which is uh, the county in which the Maryland State Archives is located. So uh, where we were working and where I was living at the time. So John Brown helps this family of three escape from slavery. This family is captured, brought back to slavery, in Maryland at the time in the 1850s, if you helped one enslaved person escape, if you were found guilty, you were sentenced to six years in prison per enslaved person. So in 1856, John Brown is tried and convicted despite the fact that there wasn't a single witness called in his defense and sentenced to 18 years in the penitentiary, which at that time in Maryland was not that far from Baltimore. And John Brown begins his prison term, but he doesn't live to see the end of that prison term. And uh, in the particular job I had, our, per our main mission was to bring as many of these case studies to light, to push them out on the web so people could access them and have access to this history. And um, John Brown's story struck me. So I went to the archival record to look at the penitentiary laws and um, I go all the way to the right of the penitentiary log, and that's where they have the discharge information. And next to John Brown's discharge information, it simply read, died of a pistol shot by officers. Mm -hmm. And it really sort of moved me back. Um, and so I wanted to, you know, this is why I started the PhD program. I just wanted to go as far as I could. So I go to, the newspaper archives of the Baltimore Sun to see if there's any coverage about this. And I find two newspaper articles that talk about the killing of John Brown and the penitentiary. And the ways that the newspaper articles rendered the story goes that John Brown was serving a term of 18 years. He became impudent one day um, and was displaying insubordination. Uh, these are the words that the newspaper article used. Um, and that the warden at the time wanted to punish John Brown. And um, so one newspaper article talks about the fact that he had been shot. And then the second newspaper article talks about John Brown allegedly having a razor blade that he tried to use against the warden. Um, and that's what prompted the warden to uh, fire and strike and kill John Brown. And that's where the archival trace ends. Now I mentioned that because it brings together so many different things that have already been brought up here today. Um, it talks about the uh, price that people who were in alliance and in solidarity with enslaved people had to bear. But also I think it speaks to the debt that we have in the present to understand that when we're hearing and reading stories about police violence in 2021 or in 1992 in LA, um, or in 2006, when I was a student of yours, Professor Alexander and Sean Bell was murdered in New York City by New York yeah. NYPD, that there's a certain continuum. And our obligation is to hold history to account. And the only way that happens is through working on the unfinished project of abolition, as Sadia Hartman might say. So that's what I have uh, to share with everyone here today. And um, I really enjoyed hearing your stories as well. Mm, mm, mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, I think also about um, the language that's uncovered. I think, you know, 
uh, insubordination as uh, a, a, a word that won't go away and that does so much uh, work to cover, uh, uh, you, you know, um, violence uh, and, and uh, um, you know, racialized violence. Um, that, wow, that is an amazing story. Thank you. I, I wonder, actually, since now um, we're out as as, as Jarrett uh, was <laughs> my student, I'm very, very uh, proud to see all that he has done. And, and, and I wonder also, I'm thinking about um, how probably the Beinecke Library is somewhere I might have sent you. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. uh, what was what was that like as as a as a young student uh, going there and, and finding things in the context of an African American studies class? Yeah, the Beinecke Library is actually the first place I was employed as um, at that time I was a student, but uh, it's the first time I was employed in a library setting. So um, I obviously went to use the Beinecke for a number of classes at Yale, and um, I just remember one of the um, at the time, I didn't know that being a professional archivist was an option. Um, it was, uh, I knew obviously about um, librarians. I, the neighborhood library where I grew up in Gary, Indiana was very near to me. Um, but the world of archives was largely um, off my radar. So being at the Beinecke, seeing the James Wood and Johnson collections, um, seeing the papers of Langston Hughes, of so many other um, others who, who've given their uh, time in their lives to, to sacrifice was definitely moving for me. And um, <laughs> foolishly, I thought that every campus had something like that. But as I um, yeah, graduated okay. and moved on, I realized that not everybody had the same types of resources that the Bionic had. But I also realized that that doesn't mean that the stories that other communities hold are not as valuable, right? So the, the stories that are mm -hmm in the Beinecke Library do not matter more than the stories being lived and being recorded in the city of New Haven, right? One of the one of the uh, mm -hmm. most impoverished and over police uh, places in, in Connecticut. So um, it was definitely a yes. formative, formative experience for me. Well, and you mentioned your, your neighborhood library in Gary, and I, I, I'm thinking about just the convergences of um, reading and studying and digging with the world that we live in. And, you know, Dr. Hayden, when you were at the Enoch Pratt Library, famously keeping the library open and with as with a community function during the Freddie Gray uh, murder and its aftermath uh, and, and, and understanding and enacting what it meant to make the library uh, a necessary part of community in a moment of crisis. And I often think uh, as at the Library of Congress with the Rosa Parks papers, and we were able to digitize them and, and have an exhibit, how it, important it would have been at that branch library where people saw it on right there with the uh, drugstore burning and all of that, and we had the library open. Mm -hmm. and. The, the children from the neighborhood, of course, were coming. Everybody was coming to the library. It's the only place open and a lifeline. And I remember looking out, and she was 10, and she just said, what is the matter? What is going on? Mm. And it would have been nice right then if we could have hooked up to the Rosa Parks papers where she talks about being that same oh, age and being yes. angry and wanting mm. to hit a little white kid and all of this that you have this woman that everybody thinks so you know you see her later and she's saintly but she had she chant and her grandmother and she's writing this in her own hand on a note paper had to have her channel and told her you need to channel that anger and do yeah. some things that to be able to in the moment in these branch libraries all over to be able to connect with documents or things that show them the context uh, mm -hmm. it would have been a powerful experience. So that drives a lot of what we're doing now. And to connect with uh, Kelly and uh, Jared and the projects that you're doing, we hope that we'll be able to do that. This is a on-camera <laughs> live uh, connection, <laughs> but to, to have these connections uh, and a portal in a way that we can uh, make sure that people get access to all of these types of stories and the new stories that need to be told for the old ones. 
And we should also say, just for the sake of context, I mean, um, where Dr. Hayden is speaking to us right now, uh, she is in the Library of Congress uh, at uh, 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 you know, feet, yards away uh, from the impeachment trial. So yes. please tell us about where you are right now. I'm actually in the James Madison building and it's right next to uh, the old St. Caddy corner uh, from the Capitol mm -hmm. building and right next to that is the Thomas Jefferson building. So we're part and there's an Adams building right here. Uh, and even though the members of the staff that are helping Congress right now and the staff members are helping them, uh, congressional staff with the trial and, and all of the background that's going on. You have uh, the fencing, the hosting of the National Guard as well. And staff members though that are also working on making sure that we connect with Howard University as well as the Smithsonian in terms mm -hmm. of collecting some of the material that is being uh, left, especially at Black Lives Matter Plaza. We've been doing that and helping the, mm -hmm. the uh, people who are trying to preserve and make sure that the signs and the things that were left on the fence are cataloged, archival work or uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, photographed, all of these types of things. So to be in physically a place where you know that we have to make sure that stories are being told and recorded so that someone 30 years from now, 50 years from now, will get these first-hand accounts and actually be able to get an insight into what really happened. Mm -hmm. We're living in, I think we can all agree, a time when having your story of 1976 those same types of things were happening That's then. Right. And in 19, when 18, right there, someone was carrying a razor, really. <laughs> All of this, putting mm -hmm. it in context. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I have many questions for, for all of you, but I also want to pause because there's so much richness on the table and perhaps you have comments or questions for each other. Yes, um, in light of what Dr. Hayden just shared, uh, I wanted to ask Dr. Hernandez um, if you could talk about your concept of the rebel archive that you describe in your book, City of Inmates, which uh, I read this time last year as a part of my general exams process. And I learned a lot from it. Um, and I learned a lot from that concept in particular. So um, I think that um, Dr. Hayden's story is a great entree for you to, to talk about that concept and how your work fits within the framework of a rebel archive. Mm -hmm. well, sure, and thank you. And when I was listening to Carla speak, I was also thinking about um, the saying that history can be told through fences and barbed wire, right? And so how important it is that you're collecting up precisely the, the fences and what's tacked to it right now. So thank you for being in the present and sort of fighting to, to preserve all of that. So what Jarrett raises is in my last book, which is the story of the rise of mass incarceration in Los Angeles, um, I confronted this problem I talked about earlier that the two organizations that are responsible for managing the jails in Los Angeles, the Los Angeles Police Department, and the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, have destroyed the vast majority of their historical records. And so it was very difficult to get at the history. But as I, I journeyed and I continued to, to press and to work and to open up back doors, um, I figured out that there was actually a lot of material that remains that ex extent and that it's the people who have experienced policing. It's the people who have fought policing and incarceration, the rebels themselves, the insurgents, the protesters who have left records, not just across Los Angeles, but around the world, across the United States. And so I went from city to city to city, collecting it all up. And in all kinds of far flung boxes from Supreme Court records to um, Department of Health records to Immigration Service records, 
they were always tucked away, these little files that somehow evaded police destruction. So when you brought all that together, the pieces of paper and ephemera that survived police destruction, and the words and the deeds of the people who have fought back across time, I was able to join that all together to build this thing called the Rebel Archive that has persisted um, despite numerous attempts to wipe the story from history. So that, that's the Rebel Archive that, that I worked with, but many people work with such archives in a variety of ways. I just, um, one day when I was writing the introduction, came up with that term <laughs> and sort of threw it on there. Um, and so that's part of the work that we're doing here in Los Angeles right now is making sure we're retaining the Rebel Archive of the last 40 years of work that's been happening in LA. Um, the experiences that people have had with policing and incarceration, but also the extraordinary social movement that has grown and grown and grown in LA. I have to say that even before the uprisings of this summer, LA was already standing at the precipice of ending the age of mass incarceration, of moving toward, I wish I could say abolition, but certainly ending this period and beginning to build a new system. And so we wanted to engage in the work of retaining the records and the voices of the people who, who forced that change. And predominantly it is um, the residents of South Central, the residents of Watts, the residents of East LA and P Pacoima, Lancaster, who have really bared the burden of excessive policing and over-incarceration. So that's the Rebel Archive. Um, I know that they exist across the country and around the world and certainly want to support people in doing that work. And I must acknowledge Mellon, which has stepped up to help us bring all of these records um, to preserve them, but also digitize them and make them publicly accessible so that community members can hold on to their stories. So, you know, we're going out there, we're not just collecting up um, sort of traditional records, but we're looking at the ephemera, the mixtapes of their lives, the love letters yeah. that they sent to each other back and forth across right. the bars. Um, we're doing oral histories and we're bringing police records into the uh, equation. So we're triangulating all this. Community members are driving and selecting what gets preserved and then we're gonna make it available. So kudos to the Mellon Foundation for supporting this work. Oh, it is our, it is our, our, our pride and privilege to be able to be helpful to the extraordinary work that, that you all are doing. And, and as I hear you, you talk and, and listen to me, I'm thinking about individual lives, privacy, uh, people's things, their letters that they write and live without any intention usually uh, of having it be seen uh, by people outside of the context for which they're used. Um, you know, I, I think about um, uh, one of my archival forays, uh, now that you're at Harvard, Jarrett, in the um, in the Peabody Museum, the archives of Caroline Bond Day. I don't know if you mm -hmm. found them. Yeah. Um, um, black woman anthropologist. And um, it, she yes. has uh, photographs uh, that she takes uh, for her book, uh, A Study of Some Negro White Family in the United States, which comes out in 1931. And these photographs uh, are from sort of the 1920s of black people who she knows. And in her letters, they will often say, basically like, why are you taking my picture? What are you gonna <laughs> do with it? Uh, and that you also find fascinating letters where some people say, well, it becomes clear that someone is passing <laughs> and so they say, well, you can take my picture, but don't tell so-and-so that it's part of this you know, colored people yeah. project um, yeah. and how she negotiates privacy. Um, so how do you all think about um, individual lives, privacy, and also about the role of technology uh, in, 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 in the archive? And Professor, uh, and I'm going to call you Professor Alexander too, and uh, Dr. Alexander, I have a copy in one of my prized possessions is of her dissertation. Uh, <gasps> and she has that full page. I found it in a used we, bookstore. Well, yes. There's a pullout, a multi-page pullout with gradations of hair. And she yes. is part of her dissertation went and she starts from 100% Negroid 
all the way up and it's a pull out thing. It's 1930 something that she did that. And yes. So just to, to think about what people might have thought as she was clipping the hair. <laughs> exactly. A that, and, that, that, and that hair is in the archive. That hair is at the museum see? now. The actual hair. So what I have that also she heard photographed is, and took. The whole see, she the, photographed it. Right. And that now that we have different technology, there are some people who are going to the DNA in yes. the hair. They're seeking to, to do family history. So it goes so so that that is amazing. Technology. Uh, and technology. So technology, privacy, race, archive. What are some thoughts? Yeah, so um, I have a lot of um, comments I want to share. Uh, the first is I would be a negligent librarian if I didn't use this moment as a chance to recommend a book for people who are watching. If you want to learn more right. about uh, Dr. Caroline Bond Day um, and other early pioneers in anthropology, there's a book entitled African American Pioneers in Anthropology um, that talks about um, Caroline Bond Day, Zora Neale Hurston, um, St. Clair Drake, no relation, um, and many others who were doing the work that Dr. Hernandez uh, has been emphasizing with Rebel Archives. These are people who were collecting stories of sharecroppers, um, of, of domestic workers in the South in the 1930s and 40s um, who are not able to um, access the, the halls of power to become a trained formal archivist, uh, but who are doing, who are doing the work. Um, so when I think of privacy um, and really the tenderness and gentleness of holding stories um, of someone like a John Brown, of someone um, like the many people we talked to in Cleveland, Ohio, when we created the archive six years ago, um, privacy is of utmost significance um, because in a lot of cases, um, especially with the type of work that I've been involved in, we're talking about policing, we're talking about imprisonment. In some cases, these are the worst days of people's lives, right? These are like moments mm -hmm. that have shifted the trajectory of, of not only their lives, but their family, their friends, their loved ones. Um, and so I think it's absolutely incumbent for people to uh, who are doing this work to be mindful of um, people's desires, sometimes to be forgotten. Um, that's something that in my training as an archivist um, was not something we very much talked about, but I would make the case we need to talk about. Um, some people want to strategically evade the archive. And um, so in speaking of another Mellon project, I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, the Documenting the Now project, which Mellon has graciously generated, uh, funded um, for the last couple of cycles. And this is a project um, run by Burgess Jewels um, and others at Shift Collective and cooperation and um, in collaboration with Micah Broadnex, uh, Jessica Neal, um, and many others um, to train and work with community members to think critically about these issues, to think um, how can they maintain the records and archives that they want for the purposes they need and limit access where necessary. Because we also, uh, as you know, the events of January 6th, revealed among others, are living in a time of intense um, violence and, and uh, directed um, antagonism towards uh, people who stand up for black lives and in defense of black lives. And, um, you know, social media records have been used by police departments uh, to, to be mined, to identify so-called agitators. Um, and we just want to be mindful of that as memory workers. So that's how one of the many ways, so Documenting the Now is a project where um, I've been involved in, where we've had very serious conversations about ethics of privacy. And um, mm. we, we didn't have those conversations late. We had those conversations early. Like as, as soon as, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter in this current iteration was, was taken off. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so I would like to ask, Sure. So at UCLA, part of what we're doing is also building the infrastructure for the UCLA Ethnic Studies Centers to have digital collections. And why is this important? It's important because in, in many cases, um, it's the sense of control that we need to have over our story and who is going to have access to it in the future. Yes, we can set dates in terms of when things are accessible, what's accessible at what range. But in addition, 
50 years from now, 100 years from now, 200 years from now, what will be the community that's retaining these records and assessing our stories? And so it's been very important to the communities that we work with that they know that black folks, that brown folks, that indigenous folks, that um, marginalized communities will be the ones who are retaining and taking care of their stories and helping to bring them to the world. So that's one of the pieces um, about moving a story into the public that we have found to be important with the communities that we work is that they wanted to make sure our communities control access in perpetuity um, to the records and to the stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also giving and, them the and tools just, and training for it. Oh, I'm sorry, that, that's another thing that no, I was um, gonna... the, in terms of, to give them the tools and the training. And uh, when Jarrett mentioned that he didn't, most people don't know what an archivist does or, or the archival mm -hmm. methods or things like that. So part of what Bellin has done for the Library of Congress is to give us the opportunity to go into communities with those types of opportunities, internships, uh, paid internships, <laughs> Uh, to do that type of work and then also help groups that are already archiving in their communities and giving them small grants and working with them. So empowering the communities and letting them yes. know this is how we can help with this and we want you to add the stories to bigger archives as well. Yes, it's important yes, that yes. the stories stay in the communities, but when appropriate, that they are part of a broader tableau too, and not marginalized. And how do we, you know, that, that, that's big work, what you're describing there, right? Um, you know, I mean, that's, you know, the profound work of integrating American history um, in its sort of day-to-day -day understanding uh, as having, uh, um, and sorry, I'm losing my little ear thing, but if you can hear me, I can hear you. Um, uh, it, 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 what it means to say uh, that one of the things that we know is if you're male or, or if you're white or if you have wealth or if you have institutional affiliation, your story is more likely, your life in artifacts is more likely to be preserved. So I, I just want to underscore um, the incredible power of what the three of you are doing and so many others to say that it can't be that way anymore. You know, it just, it just, it just can't be that way. And Kelly, I know that, that you've talked about um, your uh, Million Dollar Hoods research team as being, um, is it the I, I exaggerate, so I'm like, it's the largest black and brown research team in all of recorded history, but it's, it's something like that. Could you, could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, that, I'll take that. That sounds wonderful. Um, so <laughs> we at UCLA, Million Dollar Hoods is a big data um, research team, and we acquire arrest and jail data, and we work with community members to analyze um, recent and current trends in policing and incarceration. So we have a pretty substantial um, data analytics team and data visualization team. And I do describe the team as probably the only, if not one of the very few um, black led, indigenous led, um, big data teams in the country. And that matters for the kind of analysis that we do. And I believe it's certainly part of the power of storytelling that we've engaged in and why we've been able to work so closely with community um, to shift narratives around policing and incarceration. Um, because when you put the people who've been most impacted in control of the algorithm, right, all of a mm -hmm. sudden, the data science story that comes out of why certain communities get policed and others do not looks a lot different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think also just having the, you know, the, the perspective and ability to, to look at something and say, this is why this is relevant. This is what this means. This is the consequence of this. Um, and, and, and what it means also to have many eyes and angles 
on uh, a document or an object to say, this is what this could mean. Um, uh, you know, that's, that's the importance of the work. Um, I, I want to turn now because we have so um, many people who are so engaged and I have questions just rolling in. So um, uh, please, if you would send in your questions, I have a number here uh, and I want to uh, start asking. So let us look at from an attendee named Achilles. What data is needed for making policies to reform the criminal justice system in America? And maybe Jarrett could take that question, um, you know, thinking about uh, your uh, your abolitionist perspective and commitment uh, and to how I, I have here something that you've talked about um, questions of um, belonging uh, and of, um, I have it here, thinking about, um, well, just how you're thinking about um, mm -hmm. prison abolition with the questions that we're talking about today. Yes. Um Thank you for that question, Achilles. And um, I would preface my response, um, as has been mentioned in my uh, biography and um, some of the comments I've made, that I um, engaged my politics, my scholarship, my organizing, um, which meld all together from an abolitionist standpoint. And what that means is that I don't accept that the present state of how we respond as a society to harm um, is is acceptable. I don't find it acceptable. Um, I uh, have, through the course of my years of research, experience, um, and teaching, found um, reform to be, quite frankly, not in alignment with the safety um, and preservation of, of, of Black life. So in terms of how much data is needed, uh, what kinds of data are needed, um, I would make the case that we actually have an abundance of data about what does not work, right? We have the the police reports of the um, of the murder of Ayanna Stanley Jones in Detroit, Michigan. Um, after which, as she slept on her couch in Detroit, Michigan, after which her grandmother, who was there with her, was arrested and charged for provoking an officer, despite the fact that this uh, team of officers actually entered the wrong house, right? Uh, we have stories mm -hmm. upon stories of. Um, everything that one can imagine to try to reform, policing, prisons, has been tried. Um, and um, that's why I, I arrive at, a, at an abolitionist praxis and politics. Um, so I think in terms of the data that I'm trying to collect and generate and engage as a scholar, um, it's focused on uh, what building the type of world in which we want to live, building a world in which relationships are restored, where care is prioritized, where care is de-institutionalized and more practiced in people's day-to-day -day lives. Um, that comes uh, from, from different types of interactions, a different type of engagement. It's not state mandated, right? Abolition is not a policy that gets passed. It's a way of engaging um, in, a, in a responses to harm that in, 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 the, in of themselves do not create more harm. Um, and um, I'll have some more answers to this once I finish this dissertation um, and uh, put it out into the world. Um, and there are other um, scholars, some on this call, especially Dr. Hernandez, whose work I think has also helped uh, to, to reveal that we actually know what's going on and we kind of know where we need to, to get. Uh, what we need are more resources. We need more people. We need um, more care and more love and more justice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, from Nicholas at Florida State University, what challenges for archivists do you see presented by the increasingly ubiquitous role of social media in documenting social activism? We touched briefly on that, but there's more to, to say about that. What new opportunities? And there are a couple of related questions. Social media is a digital community platform of discourse, which is a very important part of preserving narratives. How can we preserve them? And what are the ways we can do that? How do you leverage social media to create accessibility uh, in, uh, in archiving? So anyone can jump in on that. Well, I'll, I'll jump in on that. Uh, the Library of Congress for instance, had started 
working with Twitter early on and with the Arab Spring and saying, mm. okay, this is a social movement, this is a, a new platform or new way to communicate and that. It quickly became untenable to uh, harness all of the, uh, the rapid growth, the acceleration of the use of social media. And when you look at those platforms, we have web um, archives that we are capturing and working on digital futures. But it is something that's a challenge in terms of working with the companies, working with the different platforms. So I'd be interested in the um, other panelists and how you are working with that. Social media. <laughs> Yeah, I can I can go ahead. Um, so as I mentioned, um, I was on the advisory board for the documenting the now project from its um, first granting cycle from Mellon, um, and this was a project again of which Burgess Jules um, uh, was the principal investigator, and um, uh, Burgess and um, um, another person who worked at and may still work at the Library of Congress, Ed Summers. They had a conversation at the Society of American Archivists meeting in uh, 2014, um, just days after uh, Michael Brown Jr. was killed in Ferguson, Missouri, and the explosion in Twitter with the Black Lives Matter hashtag really um, prompted a lot of people to consider, and I think the, the analogy I've heard Burgess use time and time again is that thinking of the Watts uprising in 1965, right? And and what would it have been like for people at that uprising to have the power to like document their stories in, in the present? Um, and so Burgess and Ed and others collaborated to build a tool to enable people um, to, to ethically and responsibly collect social media content um, pertaining to different, to different um, social movements and um, really emphasizing that when scholars, when researchers um, are engaging in this type of, a, um, of, of collecting work, that it's done in a way that respects people's privacy. Um, so this project is still ongoing um, and um, this work is, is still ongoing. And uh, there's one last point I wanted to make about social media and archives is that we've spoken a lot today about collecting, but I also want to talk about archives as uh, all trained archivists do from a point of access. And I think that there are some really important and amazing things that can that can happen with access through social media. Um, all of the libraries that we've collectively worked at here on this call have robust social media accounts that share content, and those are important and interesting. But I want to talk about people uh, who, uh, you know, are, are collecting community history and sharing it on Instagram, they're sharing it on Facebook, they're sharing it on Twitter. Um, and, you know, they're not like in the in, under the employ of a repository. But to me, that work is as critical and as necessary and significant to what we're talking about when we talk about the intersections of archives and, and social media. So um, since I've transitioned out of like my, my formal job as an archivist, that's actually the space, the sort of more ethnographic space to uh, tap into my uh, anthropological um, uh, placement now, that more ethnographic space of, of social media to me is, is um, especially important. Mm -hmm. Kelly, did you want to add no. anything? Well, no, I don't work in social media and I'm, you know, can ask my children about this. I'll say, don't ask her anything about social media. But, um, I, did, right? I did want to take a quick step back to, I think it was Achilles and really affirm what Jarrett was saying about, um, we have tried reform over and over. We've had the Wickersham Commission, the Kerner Commission um, and so on. We've tried implicit bias training. We've tried diversity. None of it has resulted in the well-being of black folks uh, when it comes to policing in the United States. And so we are at this point, I think, where many of us are thinking about abolition and real radical transformative change, which is very good. However, right, when we think historically, we have been at this precipice before. We have been at the end of enslavement and stood at the uh, brink of emancipation. We have been at the end of the civil rights, or the end of Jim Crow, and really thought about what a civil rights era would look like. 
And at every turning point, there has been a new vice that was developed, right? Jim Crow follows enslavement, mass incarceration, incarceration follows Jim Crow. So when it comes to collecting data right now, I don't think there's much we have to prove, but we're gonna keep on pushing. We're gonna keep collecting the data. We're gonna keep collecting the stories. We're gonna keep shifting the narrative. But it's also critically important that as Jared is talking about, we document the now, that we stay on top and cautious about what this transition is. Are we going to head toward liberation or are we in the middle of reforming our way to a new regime? And so documenting the now is so exciting to me for, for many reasons, but I, I just think we have to be extraordinarily cautious and observant and try to collect up the data that shows us an indication of what direction we are heading in so that we can act fast and act quick if changes need to be made. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a question, I think the, the last one we'll have time for, from Megan Holt at One Book, One New Orleans. Uh, she asks, if a non-academic were to ask, what do the archives and your work have to do with my day-to-day -day life? How would you recommend I respond? What everybody could, do. could take a step into that. Well, we want to make sure that it's not just an academic exercise. And that's what empowering communities and going into communities and saying your story is just as important and brings context to history that can be shared with other people. And so I know that the work that we try to do and are working at the Library of Congress is to make it not just a place for scholars and put scholars in quotes. Uh, that it's, this, this is living history and you can make history and it relates to you and not just an ivory tower exercise that you're looking through archives or you're doing this. This can give you context and, and hope in history, hopefully. Mm. Um, I will respond to that question from New Orleans with um, actually referring to a short poem by uh, Lucille Clifton. Um, my sweater uh, in the center is Audre Lorde, poet, librarian, um, activist, uh, one of the founding members of the Kambahi River Collective. So I think poetry um, and one of the main things I learned from uh, Professor Alexander is a way of reimagining the world. And she has a really short poem, Lucille Clifton does, that I want everyone to, uh, to take note of. And the title of the poem is, Why They Be Mad at Me Sometimes. And it's a very short poem. She says, they ask me to remember, but they want me to remember their memories. And I keep on remembering mine. Um, that is how archives impact everyone on a day-to-day -day basis. It shapes the spaces that we inhabit, and it shapes the spaces we can inhabit. Um, it's not to say that archives over-determine every aspect of daily life, daily life, but it is to say that insistence on memory is a deeply personal and affective one. Um, and the things that uh, certain people in power are most afraid of is people who refuse to forget, who, who demand, again, to harken back to Sadia Hartman from earlier, who, who demand that the debt be paid, that the work towards mm -hmm. abolition continues. Um, so Lucille Clifton, why they be mad at me sometimes is uh, always my go-to um, when I've done liberatory memory work, uh, workshops with Documenting the Now and elsewhere. And, and you know, that, that amazing poem uh, was written when Lucille Clifton was Poet Laureate of the State of Maryland. And she was asked to write a poem on our wonderful colonial history. <laughs> and uh, so that's the poem she wrote. And she said, well, this do, this is what yeah. I have to say about our colonial history. So. Uh, uh, I'm so glad you brought that to, to the fore. Uh, Dr. Lytle Hernandez, this, this will be uh, uh, the, the last word. Um, and I would also just uh, uh, wanna say before you answer and comment, um, it's so powerful to me how, um, and so beautiful to me, how everyone here is 
uh, talking about and envisioning freedom in, in, in all uh, of its width and possibility. So. Well, I'm not sure there's a better way to, to end the program than with the poem that was just shared with us. But I would certainly say to Megan that history is the way we understand the present and imagine the future. And so we really need to understand and know everybody's experience with, say, the colonial era um, to be able to build a more liberatory future in which all of us have a place and all of us can thrive. So that is what's at stake here is making sure that we remember and we preserve the experiences, especially, especially the most marginalized. So as we march toward freedom, we can make sure that we're kicking open every door that needs to be opened. Well, I want to thank you all. My heart is bursting. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I, I, I just thank you for all you shared, for your knowledge, for your generosity, uh, for your collectivity, for your work for who you are, uh, uh, to, to, to give you uh, gratitude uh, for being uh, here with us tonight. And to all of the people who I sure wish we could see, uh, but we can't, uh, we know you're there. And so many of you took the time to come and join this conversation. Who said archives are not the most interesting thing in the whole wide world? <laughs> so to all of you who came and, and joined us tonight, uh, thank you so much to um, all of the hands and minds who helped us uh, uh, make this uh, available. Thank you. And um, uh, uh, just, you know, heartful. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you all. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll see you at the next conversation. Good night.